Hey guys, and welcome to the Publishing Sci-Fi and Fantasy Romance with Con Carolinas. I am your moderator, Cecilia Dominic, and I'll be popping slides up through the presentation for those of you who are like me and a little bit more visual and it helps you to actually see the questions, but then for the actual discussion, I'll switch back to our lovely moderators because I don't know about you guys, but this is the first Sunday in probably weeks, if not months, that I've actually put on makeup. So we could go ahead and get our panels, uh, panelists to do a little intro. Hi, I'm R.E. Carr, otherwise known as Rachel Carr, uh, author of the Rules on Dying series, the False Icon series, which I write with Rick Gualtieri, and the science fiction romance, The Download, and I'm really happy to be here. Hi, my name is Alexandra Christian, and yes, you're joining me in my bedroom. Lucky you. I uh, write paranormal and some contemporary romance. I also dabble a little in horror. Um, I am the author of Huntress, which um, John Hartness likes to refer to as Hot Dragon Sex. Um, I'll let you judge for yourself. And the Phoenix Rising series, which is a sci-fi romance. Hi, I'm Emily Leverett. I'm an author and editor and a medievalist English professor. I'm the author of The Wolf in the Cloister, which is the first in my paranormal historical romance series based on the life of Marie de France, a 12th century nun in England. Hi, I am Susan Roddy. I write dark fantasy and horror as S.H. Roddy. I also write romance of all kinds as Shivani Kincaid. I also am a formatter, cover artist, and developmental editor, freelance, of course, and uh, like everybody else, I'm just happy to be looking at people right now. <laughs> <laughs> and hi, I am Cecily Dominic. By day, I'm a clinical psychologist, and I help people sleep without drugs. By night, I'm a USA Today bestselling author of urban fantasy and steampunk. And behind me, you can see my latest release, The Shadow Project, which was released in April. And all of my books pretty much have a romance element, even though they are primarily uh, mysteries within the genre. So when you're writing across genres, it can be kind of hard to figure out where do you start? Do you start with, for example, urban fantasy and then add the romance? Do you start with the romance and go with more paranormal? So how do you guys decide before writing what your balance is going to be, or do you even decide before writing? All right, I'll start with mine. Um, the genre that Marie de France wrote in, in the Middle Ages is called romance. So that basically just means knights and ladies and stuff like that. But she was also very interested in women's experience and centered a lot of women in her stories in ways that they just aren't in a lot of other stories. Um, and romance tends to do that as well. The way that romance puts at the center of most stories, women's ideas and women's pleasure is different. And so it just seemed to fit that I was writing a kind of medieval romance that would work really well for a modern romance. Um, and it's the first time I've tried romance, so that made it interesting too. My books always start um, as a romance, because I'm a romance novelist. Um, and the relationship story is always first for me. Um, I really like for there to be, um, I guess, an, an adventure story uh, or a mystery or, or something else that's going on, like a high stakes adventure that's going on around these two people or more if, you know, you like that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I always start, I always start with the romance and then I kind of build the, the rest of it around them. I do the exact opposite. I start with the story and I find that the romance creeps in almost like a little fungus. I don't know. That's like the most romantic thing I could think of, a fungus. It's the fungus among us. It is the fungus <laughs> among us. But I like, I like that whole thing of you write a story and you make, if you make really good characters and you put really good characters together, I find that sparks just naturally fly. And I am a total kamikaze. I don't really start with anything concrete. Well, I used to. I'm getting to where I tend to outline a little more. But for the most part, when it's not something that's part of a series or something that I'm writing for a specific call, I start with the idea. I let it build. If it turns into romance, great. If it doesn't, it goes into the other category. And because I write across so many different genres, 
it, I never know where I'm really going to go when I get started or where I'm going to end up because a lot of times things that I think may be romance, yeah, somebody dies in a really gruesome way and that's just not romance. So I must be doing romance wrong. I have, I have a fair amount of, I have kittens and blenders and romance. Oh, okay. I can, I can go for that. <laughs> I can go for that. Not in the like, same scene. <laughs> well, no, because that would just be messy. Yeah. And that's a whole different genre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. My cat has now exited the room. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so, um, yeah, when I do it, I have started doing more outlining um, as well. Like Susan said, I think just because it helps me to do, to do it faster. That's writing romance. It helps you to do that faster. So I typically will start with a male lead and a female lead. And then, yeah, see what happens as they come together. So we've all heard the phrase, right to market. So in your cases, how does marketing strategy influence what you decide to write next? Or does it at all? Are you thinking about, okay, I really want to do this kind of book because I know it will sell well, or are you more on the inspiration side? Let's just see what comes. Or somewhere in the middle. Dear God, I wish I could do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish I could. I, um, I don't know. I've, I've tried to write the market before and either by the time I finish the book, the market's completely changed or, um, I fail miserably. Like I decided to write, a, I said I was going to write a billionaire romance. So I started out writing this billionaire romance, you know, a la 50 shades, the whole thing, because that's what was going on at the time. And it turned into a story about, you know, a girl who falls in love with the angel of death. So it really didn't work out, you know? Um, I, but I really wish that I could. I mean, it seems to work for a lot of people to, um, to follow trends and, and, you know, write to whatever market, whatever happens to be hot right now. And that's a big thing in romance. That's a big, writing to particular tropes is a big thing, because I mean, tropes are how people find, I mean, tropes used to be like the dirty word, you know, you didn't want to, mm -hmm. you didn't want to write something that was tropey. Well, now that's how people find what they like on Amazon. I mean, if you've got, you know, 20 million books, and you are a person who has a very specific thing that you like, you're going to go look at those keywords. So, tropes have become a big issue in romance and the trends they change so quickly and I am just not one of those people that can write an entire you know 65,000 word novel or 85,000 word novel or whatever in a month. I, NaNoWriMo is not for me <laughs> so I mean I would love to be able to but I just can't. I, I write 125,000 word doorstops and those are my short novels so I I can't chase trends I have to just kind of really hope that I make one um I wrote vampires when it wasn't cool and then they became cool again so I got lucky with that um but I think if you write a good story a good craft and you have good characters I mean you may not get the big bursts like some of the right to market but I mean muses are jerks if they tell you <laughs> what you want to write, you're going to have to do it. And I invest in too big a story to just do it. And the only thing I will say is that when I actually market a book, I may tweak how I present it. Mm -hmm. Like, even though my vampires are completely and totally science-based, I market it on the mysterious vampire romance element because that sells better. Um, you know, when in doubt, yeah, sure, there's magic. There's no magic. There's really no magic. <laughs> well, it all depends on how you define magic. Yep. See, I'm I'm the same way. I my ideas tend to grow the more I write. You know, I'll start out with something that yeah, we can do this in a novella, and then I've got a hundred thousand words sitting in front of me, and I have no idea what to do with it. <laughs> and it so you know, I I can't write to market because my attention span is not that long. But when I get into something and I know definitely, hey, this is going to be romance, I do like to play with the tropes just to see how I can, I like to break things. And if I can break a trope and people still like it, then I feel like my job is done. That's amazing. I can you give that. us an example of doing that recently? 
Well, I've got, I actually have a series that's under contract with Falstaff Books up in Charlotte. It is a contemporary series, and the main characters, they are, the heroes of the story, they are a band. They are rock stars. And I have, I have played with every single silly romance trope I could possibly find. And it has turned into this massive story arc that involves all subterfuge and money laundering and all <laughs> kinds of other crazy garbage that should have nothing to do at all with this. So yeah, I've, I take one or two tropes and I throw them in a blender and just see how bad it can possibly get. And so far my editor hasn't killed me. Give him time. So, yeah, well, I'm finishing book three now. It's a five book series. I may not survive till the end. For me, trying to write romance was my stab at writing to the market. Like that was as far as I got in it. Um, and on the other hand, like I think I edited for the market. Like my editor was really great about telling me things like, okay, this is what this needs, like, you know, tropes and keywords and events and like basically it's a romance, your book has to have sex in it, um, was something that she had to explain to me because I was still in the mindset of, but this is just the first book and they can't have sex till the end, right? No, it doesn't work that way anymore. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, so for me, I, I've sort of, I think, been edited towards the market as opposed to writing towards it, which is a good thing. I'm really happy with it. And a good editor will do that for you. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's kind of their job is they're supposed to kind of, you know, steer you in, in one way or another and kind of make those things fit. Um, romance has been accused of being very formulaic. And in a lot of ways it is, you know, and that formula has really changed over the last 10 years. I mean, well, probably even, you know, even over the last five years. But I mean, I remember my mom reading these romances that were these big doorstops and they didn't have sex until the very end after 200,000 words, you know, and there was, you know, the big, you know, culmination of all of this slow burn that happens at the very end. Um, but yeah, that is completely different than what readers are looking for now. And so now the formula is kind of, you know, if your characters are not at least heavy petting after 50 pages, then, you know, you need to edit some of that. Can you stick that in somewhere? Um, so to speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the so, quote of the day. <laughs> yeah, sorry. sorry. Romance is all about sticking it in somewhere. Sticking it in somewhere. <laughs> Mm. Well, you're not you're riding writing. it out. You know? Yeah. I have to say, I hate that, oh, romance is so tropey and it's so formulaic. And the next step in that is it's not real literature and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just annoyingly untrue. And now when I hear that, I think, yeah, because the 8 million books written by middle-aged men about falling in love with an 18-year-old ingenue are all unique and different and are not following any tropes and are certainly not Mary suing the Dickens out of that main character, right? Like, right. no, no, romance is the place where it's just not good. Right, right. Yeah, when, when my clients are telling me that they read before bed and I ask, you know, what do you read? Because, you know, I'm interested both as a, okay, are you reading anything too suspenseful? Is it keeping you up? And then also just generally, okay, what are you reading? Um, I will always correct them when they're like, I read those trashy romances. And I'm like, don't call them trashy. Somebody worked very hard on that book. I can right. tell you from experience. Um, so yeah, I think that, um, you know, this particular series, I did try to do a little bit more writing to market because yes, yeah, they are kind of hot right now. And I was lucky that I had a character in my Lycanthropy Files series who needed, first I thought she needed her own book. As it turns out, I've then realized she needed her own trilogy. And I have now, I'm now writing books two, and I have realized that there is probably gonna be a book four and a book five. So I'm gonna go beyond the Douglas Adams trilogy. Oh, I have a and, six part trilogy, I hear you. Yeah, cause it's just so interesting and there is so much to explore between her and the main male character, which is a gargoyle. And you know what, I will, I will disagree because I think one of our current tropes that's coming back is the slow burn romance. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And oh yeah, definitely. 
And um, yeah, in this trilogy, basically, it's going to be they might have sex by the end of the second book, but so far they've only kissed. Yeah. And yeah, of course, well, they're also shorter I mean, books too. There are a lot of people who specifically ask for a slow burn. Um, yep. I saw that I was in a group the other day and I saw somebody was looking for recommendations for a slow burn reverse harem. And I was like, <laughs> I don't really think those exist. I mean, I guess they could. They do. They do. Oh yeah. No, I know of one because there was this one with a girl and three cat shifters. And, oh. um, yeah, and they they never actually um, there's there's a basically closed door a closed tent flap scene at the very end of the third book, but that's you know that's as far as they as far as they get. I, I, I would mean, be very I frustrated was, at that. Right, I was just if you're going to be getting it on with three or more people, you know, I kind of want to see that just out of morbid curiosity, honestly. I had to have somebody explain to me that reverse harm does not mean that there are all in the bedroom at the same time? Yeah, they don't have to be, no. Because no. I was like, I could not imagine those logistics. Okay, we're going beyond the PG-13 here. Sorry, yeah, we're sorry. Second, but we're keeping the tent flap closed, at least. Yeah. <laughs> we are closing the tent flap. But, you know, since we're talking about tropes, so, yeah, which tropes are you loving right now? Talking about writing to market, or which tropes do you see as being really hot? Which kind of hot tropes are you meh about? And um, I know this is the really hard one. Which ones do you see coming up? So, you know, we've already talked about Reverse Harem, which is extremely popular right now. Um, I think Academy has maybe had its peak and is on its way out, um, although they, they're still coming out, and I still see cover designers offering pre-mades for them. So uh, what other hot trips do you, see, guys, do you guys see right now? I think Reverse Harem is the biggest one that I've seen. Um, you know, you're always going to have your standards, you're going to have your vampires and your werewolves, you're always going to have your billionaires, your rock stars. It, those are the types of things that, you know, people are going to keep going back to them because they're like, they're like candy. They're crunchy and fun and <laughs> a lot of times you really don't have to think very hard because it is very much a formula. This is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, boom, the end, on to the next book. It... Can I just say that I'm really kind of tired of the whole mafia romance, high school bully romance thing where the alpha male is not really an alpha male, but he's more of an abusive jerkwad. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of that out there. And it's really frustrating because those relationships are not romantic. They're abusive. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will go for that. And it makes me crazy. I will, I will throw a book across the room so fast if I come across the hero of the book being an asshole. Yeah, I'm, I am not a fan of the bully romance genre. Sorry, if anybody was, if anybody who ever watches this is like, oh, well, you know, now I can never read anything she writes, but, um, I just, yeah, I, I just, I kind of have a problem with, I have a real problem with heroes humiliating the heroine I feel that's a deal breaker and um bully romances I mean they're based on humiliating the heroine <laughs> I just in my opinion now to be honest I have not read any um because I didn't I felt like those weren't weren't for me in the first place so I haven't read any but um so please correct me if I'm wrong but um yeah I'm not interested in that um the ones that the ones that I really like right now, I really like, I really like small town contemporaries. I'm sorry. Oh I'm the, sorry. There's no, there is no shame. We, we all have the things that we love. So yeah. what is it you love about the small town contemporaries? Because I love, okay. So first of all, small town romances are very often written by people who have a very idealized version of what living in a small town is like. <laughs> um, and it's kind of like, I really wish that the small town that I lived in was like this. Um, but they're so soapy. I love a soapy romance. I mean, I want all the suds. I want there to be, you know, the hairdresser who is sleeping with the son of the, you know, owner of the pizza restaurant, who is having an affair with the old lady that runs the, you know, the motel on the edge of town. I mean, just like, I love that. I just absolutely love that. That's one of my favorite um, tropes. And I really like it when they mix those with um, paranormal 
I think small town paranormal romances are the wave of the future. Um, and I also really like, I like, um, I like daddy romances and not daddy romances like, you know, whips and chains or anything. Daddy romances. I mean, like, like, you know, you have single dad who has a kid. I, I like those. And I'm right. I'm writing one of those right now. So that might be why, but I think men with babies are just adorable. And so I really like those kinds of romances. But do you like men with secret babies? I'm not really into secret babies because there's always like a gross thing that happened. Like I saw yeah. a, 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 like a blurb for one the other day and I was just like, it was just kind of marginal. Like the guy knocks the girl up and then, you know, um, he runs away, but she and not, or he doesn't realize that he knocked her up, but he like breaks up with her and runs away and then comes back five years later and there she is with the kid. And I mean, it's just kind of, it's just not my thing. It's just, mm -hmm. I feel like it's the stories are kind of marginal to me. There's um, a video game, a, a Japanese video game about um, finding a partner for a daddy without one. And I like that's the whole premise of the game is a daddy dating sim. And the father's actually, so you have to find the right match for him. Like, I think it's mm -hmm. his daughter, <laughs> the character you play. And it's, yeah. I mean, like, you can find anything you want in that, in, in, anime but um oh yeah i think it's just really fascinating there's like a string of games that are dating sims that are not what you would normally think there's a fried chicken dating game oh, so. i've watched that one. Oh, that one's awesome actually yeah, i've, I've oh, seen gotta that. love the colonel yep yep and it, yeah but my right now is regency romances like that to me for some reason is the quintessential like when people say romance that is the thing that they're thinking um, mm -hmm. And I just have really been enjoying them. Um, the only thing that bothers me is that I sometimes feel like they need to get themselves together about 50 pages earlier. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to have the climactic moment where you both actually say what you think you should say to each other. Can we do that 50 pages before you're doing it? Because it just starts to feel too artificial to put it back. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably one of the things that bothers me the most is when plot happens because a normally smart character suddenly becomes an idiot yeah. or things get in the way because you feel like you need 25,000 more words. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those are I don't like insta-love. Genre, but. No, I'm with you. I don't like insta-love. I also, um, the thing that makes me really want to throw the book is the great misunderstanding trope because <laughs> it's like, just communicate. Right. Yeah. Oh, like, no, no, no. You a whole conversation with you do you can't like it's like cell phones in horror movies it's just you yeah. have to get rid of communication to make a romance drag out for a bit well and that's why <laughs> you have to be it. stupid <laughs> yeah that's why you said it in the whole jane austen world where no one could be alone with each other ever yeah right? yeah <laughs> exactly people can't communicate oh i i have it bad because i write about vampires and i hate vampire romance <laughs> i'm like <laughs> i'm the ultimate jerk to myself. In fact, I wrote a vampire romance because I was dared to. Um, it's not anything particular. Like, I know there's good versions of it, but I always thought it was very creepy because effectively there's usually a century age gap in yeah. a romance. Um, but on the flip side of tropes I love, I, I have a werewolf weakness, um, as my reading history will attest to. I know there's only like three storylines, but I don't care. Um, cause you like what you like. So there's no kink shaming here. Um, so I'm hoping in the future, I would really like, like you said, like the small town, but I'd almost mm -hmm. like a telenovela with like werewolves because I think yeah. that would be amazing. Yeah. Like uh, Spanish well, soap opera level insanity meets the supernatural. Yeah. Well, that's like the, um, the thing that Emily and I were talking about before we started, the the thing she was asking me if I was going to post another piece of it's mm -hmm. like that it's like it's a small tale and there's a there's one of the um vampires in it because it's a vampire um thing but one of the vampires is a hybrid and there's a whole you know reason oh why. hybrids but that, that moves into the good territory yeah and he's like he's that. like a hybrid vampire werewolf thing even though werewolves and vampires are mortal em enemy enemies enemies in this <laughs> world <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. okay. It's the end of the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. I like to match up my werewolves with uh, medical thrillers. 
that's my like anthropy file series yeah and that's what this one is a, a spinoff of but yeah i'm kind of like you it's like i was like i'm not gonna do vampires i'm not gonna do vampires but then in uh, my third dream weavers and truth seekers book mm -hmm. i have a vampire and they're really annoying because i kind of like to stay true to the to the legend and he can only come out at night mm -hmm. um he just kind of falls literally dead asleep during the day and that one actually got nominated for a Daphne. So I was like, oh, I guess I should do more vampires. I know. I have the award-winning vampires because that's what happens. When you say you're not going to do something, I think you, as writers, we get really persnickety. Like, okay, fine. I won't do it, but I'm going to do it my way. And then yeah. you have a six -six trilogy. That's because when you do it your way, it ends up being different from what else is out there. And that gets attention. Yeah. Oh, it does. Sorry about the blender. Always comes right. back to the blender. <laughs> so speaking of getting attention, thank you for that lovely segue. Um, and since this is supposed to be about marketing, um, of course, one of the initial ways that we market to our readers is our covers. And so when you choose your covers, what elements do you make sure to include to give your readers that sense of what the book is about, what the tropes are like? I was looking through y'all's websites in anticipation of doing this panel, and um, I love it that nobody has the really super traditional naked man chest covers on their book. Not yet. Um, oh. <laughs> yet. <laughs> okay. But we and, have. <laughs> maybe I didn't go far enough into your websites. And then um, do you have any go-to cover or graphic artists that you can recommend? Because I'm sure there's going to be people watching who are looking for recommendations. So first, let's talk about the elements that you guys feel are important, you know, thinking about sci-fi, fantasy, romance to include. I had an interesting experience with the wolf in the cloister cover. Um, who, the woman who did it is Natanya Barron. She does a lot of covers oh, yeah. for all staff. Um, but she also freelances and she is amazing and I highly recommend that if you're looking for a cover you throw money at her because she also did the layout for Predators in Petticoats which is also behind me. Um, but the first cover she designed for The Wolf in the Cloister was this beautiful face first woman with like her hair back a lot like the one in the cover is already and like a medieval rose border and stuff like that. It was gorgeous and I was like oh my god that's gorgeous. And my editor was like, that's gorgeous, but that's historical fiction, not romance. It doesn't say romance on the cover. If this was just historical fiction, I would totally pick it up, but it's not. Um, and so then we ended up with what we have, which is a woman that looks possibly like maybe she could be a nun or maybe not just a medieval woman and a wolf on the cover and that, because it's got a werewolf in it and those sorts of things. But um, I, it was interesting watching that experience because my own experience means that I don't get any say in covers at all. I have no sense of graphics design. Like my whole response to a cover is put in all the things that you don't want to do. And so basically my job is to be like, that looks great. Oh, that other thing looks great too. But watching that conversation unfold between people who did know what they were talking about and did know to be like, there are certain poses, there are certain things you need if you want it to signal romance and the wolf certainly signals paranormal right and so it kind of it gets the historical in there with the costuming so it there are a whole there is a whole language of covers that i think mm -hmm. is fascinating yes. now so putting on the cover artist format or hat for a minute emily is very right it authors tend to and i'm i'm guilty of this as well authors tend to want to put everything out there so something on the cover grabs the potential reader and when you're designing a cover you're going more for atmosphere than you are content really you want it to feel kind of romantic or dark or whatever the main theme of your story is that's the feeling you want to put on the cover and you a lot of that comes down to the colors that you choose um, it comes down to body language positioning of people if you're putting them on the cover you know if it's if you're putting a cover on a horror story you want it to be dark you want it to be gritty you want it to kind of give people that moment when they look at it you know and again wolf in the cloister that is a gorgeous cover i absolutely love that cover and it does it gives you it gives you that period feeling 
it gives you a sense of romance but it's not you're not looking at that going okay this is just going to be a bunch of people in bed together you you get that there's more to it you get that there's actually movement in that story and if you look at if you look at romance covers you know, you're talking about you know mostly naked men on the cover lots big chest lots of tattoos muscles all that stuff you know you know what you're getting when you pick up a cover like that you know that that dude is going to be in that book somewhere and he's going to be really naked for at least a quarter of that book and that's okay yes and yes it is and i mean if that's what you're writing if that's the market that you're working toward that's what you need to do you know you don't you know i've got a cover i'm working on right now the author has given me a synopsis of her story and her first comment is well here's the story but i have no idea what to do with it and there are all of these little elements and things that are important to the story there's no way to get all of that on the cover so i'm having to pick and choose and kind of figure out what works best to get that overall feeling without making it look cluttered or making it just look silly and it's it's not easy from either side i can tell you that much no it's and when you're, artist, you're looking at this going, oh, they're going to hate this. And then somebody loses their mind when they loves it, love it. And you get so excited. <laughs> so well, when you think about, when you think about romance covers, you know, I don't want to be indelicate or anything. And I know we're doing PG-13, but um, think about, and I know nobody has to say that they've watched porn before. Please don't, you don't have to reveal that. But in porn movies, there is a lot of soft focus close up on people's faces. When you're doing a romance cover, if you're not going to have the torso with all of the tattoos and everything, you, one of the ways that you identify it as a romance cover is a close up picture of your characters. That's why Emily's cover reads as a romance cover because you have a, picture of a person's face mm -hmm. if you don't have that then it's not going to read as a romance cover people are not going to realize that that's what it's about um i mean torso covers it's pretty damn obvious that's what you know that's what's inside and let me tell you if you have a torso cover if you've got a naked man's chest on the cover of your book you better deliver it between the pages because if you don't the okay. readers are going to be pissed i mean pissed you do not want a naked torso cover on a slow burn book. If you got a naked torso, you better be having sex by page 50 or they're going to put you down and probably never pick you up again. So you have to be careful with those kinds of things when you're choosing, uh, when you're choosing covers. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take over. <laughs> no, I, and I love it. And I love that you said naked. That's awesome. I, yeah. yeah, I did the opposite though of most of y'all because I, I had an illustrator for my covers for one of my series because my books are weird and they're quirky and they're a mix of romance and other things. So we actually went purposeful to not look like other stuff in the genre, but to make it really graphic and bold. So you do have the face, like, like she was saying, it always has the faces of the character that's in there, but it's all about color washing with black and white. So they really stand out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I work with a guy. Yeah, named you Richard have really, Atkins. Yeah, you have really distinctive covers. And, and that's the thing. If you have a weird book that doesn't quite fit genres, you can purposefully be different. Well, I have a more traditional urban fantasy comedy where I have, you know, the glowy hands, glowy hair <laughs> type cover. And then I have Download, which was science fiction romance, and I have the fuzzy face because <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to laugh at that. And if you're doing sci-fi, something has to glow is what my oh my god says. and it has to be purple or blue you it guys okay yeah. i don't blue. know if you, i don't know if you can see this i mean of course okay. it's backwards and everything this is the cover to a, my sci, the first book in my sci-fi romance series it is purple i don't understand why sci-fi means purple it has to be purple or blue i was told that so i have blue and purple on my sci-fi romance yes. and i totally get it but i would like to say that you know if you're if you're really trying to play against genre don't be afraid of something different but the first thing i was told by my cover artist was give me a synopsis don't tell me any more than that i'm not here to read your book i'm here to sell it <laughs> and that's good it worked really well yep. because i found you're right you try to put so much in and when he showed me what he did was stripping everything down, I cried. I was like, 
it's so much prettier than I thought it was going to be. And then I never stopped questioning. It's just like the only thing I did was please make sure you use the courier font because for <laughs> some reason I'm the only human being who likes courier font on a non-history yeah. book. <laughs> yeah, you are. Um, I cannot stand courier font. I know. It's okay. So, um, yeah, let's, well, you can see with the Shadow Project, this is urban fantasy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I deliberately wanted it to look like urban fantasy. So it's got the, it's got the blue. I mean, that is definitely one of the colors. Um, it's got the looking over the shoulder pose. Yep. Um, but she's say, got the booty and the shoulder. <laughs> the booty, the shoulder. You can tell she's a badass. She's got the pointed yep. ears. You can tell she's a fae. Um, it's got Leather Atlanta jacket. skyline in the background. Yep. It's actually pleather because she's a fae and she doesn't kill animals needlessly. So, um, yeah. And this was the, the genre that I was going for. So um, thank you guys. Yeah, that was super useful. And I think our watchers, our viewers are going to have a really good idea of what to look for in their covers now. So wanted to talk about, um, and I wanted to make sure to get one of Lex's covers in here. So briefly, I'd like to talk about writing a publication schedule because I know we all have day jobs <laughs> and that's a tough one. Um, and then we can go on to uh, connecting with readers and how we do that. So let's quickly talk about what does our writing and publication schedule look like? Because, you know, we we're talking about how, you know, some people can put out 65,000, 80,000 words in a month. Um, most of us are not Lindsay Broker or, you know, other authors like that because we do have other things. So I'm curious, yeah, what do you guys, how do you fit it into your life and how often do you release your books? I write fast. I can write a lot very quickly. Um, when I edited The Wolf in the Cloister, we were fairly close to the deadline. Um, when, when I did some of the content edits and I wrote about 15,000 words in about three days for about 5,000 words. Um, cause that's what I needed. And so th that was grueling and awful, um, in terms of, because, because like 10,000 of the words were wrong, <laughs> so that made it bad, but I write fast. And so I try, I plan a lot and I would like to get, I just finished the third in the Wolf series, um, yesterday, two days ago. So I, want the fourth one done as soon as possible. And then the publication schedule is entirely up to my editor and my publisher and they don't need stuff from me. But um, I try very hard to hit deadlines and I can write during the year, but it's easier for me to write during the summer. So if I can create a schedule that lets me write when I am not being an academic in terms of teaching four classes or five classes a semester, then I can put together a set of time to do that. And my other series, Changelings Fall is the first book, and I write with a co-author, and she's also an academic. So that really means like the summer is the time when we can actually, and she lives on the um, West Coast, she lives in California. So we can find times a lot better to do that. So that's for me what I prefer is the summer. I am learning to do it year round. My writing takes place primarily at night after my kids have gone to bed. Um, my girls are eight and four, and especially right now with us being at home all the time, they take up a lot of time. They do not like it when I'm out of their sight, and I can't focus if they're in the room because one of them is going to be talking at all times. You know, having the full-time day job, having kids, you know, it's it's hard to set a schedule and stick to it because my life is chaotic mm -hmm. so like I said the majority of my writing gets done between 8 and 11 at night that's the point when they're in bed you know my husband's going to bed he's got to get up and go to work the next morning I have this time to just sit and do this and I have a goal of up to 2,000 words a day some days I hit it most days I don't but when it comes to deadlines yep yeah. No, no, no. I, I'm actually almost two years past due on one deadline. And my publisher does know where I live and may show up at my house with a machete if I don't finish that book. But, so, uh, so basically that's the Douglas Adams 
know. The Douglas Adams view of deadlines is like they're so pretty as they wish past. Well, yeah, 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 really. Well, I I wrote the book and he handed it back to me and said, no, this sucks. Do it again. And we haven't oh. been able to agree since. So <laughs> we've been fighting over it for almost two years. You know, the other series, I've got the, the contemporary romance series that's under contract. They want all five books at one time because they want to do a rapid release with it. Mm-hmm. I've written two and a half of those books. I've got two and a half to go. And they're all supposed to be done by December. And these are 70,000 word novels. So I don't know if I'm going to make it. Um, yeah, deadlines are just kind of a suggestion in my head. And they really shouldn't be. And I know that. And I feel guilty. But then I just ignore them anyway. I should also say my books in The Wolf and the Cloister are novellas, so we're looking at 35 to 50, not 70 to 90 for each. Uh, my one that's two years past two is a novella, too. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm terrible. You're not terrible. I mean, everyone does with you. I'm definitely a deadline junkie. I'm, I'm almost like, I, can't, I feel like I can't work without a gun to my head. Hence, I now have four book deadlines on my on my head. Um, I also tend to be very much a burst writer. Like I can do five thousand word. I even did a fifteen thousand word day. I highly don't recommend that. By the way, mm-hmm. do not do this. Um, of which, surprisingly, about ten thousand words were crap. But I think that's how it works. What I tend to do is I write almost to the point of burnout and sometimes beyond, and then I have to recover for a few days. It's just, um, I'm a little bit bi- <laughs> bipolar, let's just say it. Um, so I have to run when I'm in a mania state and I can do everything. And then there's going to be some weeks where it's like, I can write a sentence maybe. Um, so I guess it's what I'm trying to say is if you're not entirely normal, it's okay to have a schedule that's normal for you that might not be a, I mean, I've heard that you have to write every day to be a real writer or you have to do X number of words. It doesn't matter as long as you keep going. I mean, what the difference between a writer and a non-writer is that you finish something. Um, So I just found that you have to make it work. I have a day job. I have two kids. Um, It's a miracle sometimes. And I'm in awe of all the rest of you guys. It's nice to be around people in the same boat. I have a day job too. Um, My day job used to really lend itself to um, writing during the day when I was, uh, when I had off time during that, but it really doesn't anymore because it's changed. Um, The quarantine has really, actually, no, actually, no, the quarantine has actually kind of helped me because a lot of times when after, when I've been working all day, the last thing I want to do is stare at a computer when I get home. And so it was really hard for me to, to pull out the computer and do stuff. Um, so the quarantine has been good for that because, um, I kind of have every other day is a work remotely day. And so on my work remotely days, I have to get up anyway in my regular time. Cause I have to have, I have to be near my computer near my email and my phone. So, um, I can sit there at my table with, you know, work on one tab and write on the other tab. And that's helped. I've actually been more productive. Um, In October, my father uh, became very ill. And so any sort of normalcy that I had established is like gone um, and has been since October. (laughs) So um, I've just kind of been all over the place. Like, like most of you, I've got books that are in progress that I already owe to um, one publisher. I have another book that I've been working on slowly for two years. It is literally within like a chapter and a half of being done and I already have a cover for it, but I haven't finished the book yet. Um, Because it's just like, I, I like, it's like I'm grabbing little things from, you know, I like this one today. So I'll write a little bit of this one. I'll do this one today. And then, um, stupid me decided, well, you know, during this whole quarantine thing, I feel like I should be doing something. I'm not a good sewer. So I can't make masks. I don't cook very well. So I can't, you know, like make cookies for all the, you know, nurses in the hospital or whatever. So I felt like I needed to do something, which is where the whole, um, serial novel started because I wanted to do something that people could read for free um something they could look forward to on a weekly basis so I've been working on that too but I'm not very good with deadlines and I am such a slow writer so I don't know I'm trying to get better 
if anybody has any suggestions. <laughs> but I'm not very good at schedules. What? Drink wine. Drink a lot of wine, and then you won't care what the words sound like. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I think that's a problem, too. I think I kind of, like, agonize over every word. Like, a lot of people, they always say, oh, well, you know, you need to just slap the first draft down. It doesn't matter if it sucks. Well, it does to me. I don't want to have to write the book again. So no, my, my writing partner, Sarah, writes that way. Like, we are literally on opposite ends. Like, we will sit in the same amount of time, and I will write 3,000 words, and she will write 300 words. And her 300 words will be better than my 2,000 words because exactly, like, she is yeah. not just write it. And I really am, like, if I don't like a sentence, I'll write it again. But I won't necessarily delete the first one. So I do have to go through and pick the one description of the doorknob that I like until I realize I shouldn't be describing the doorknob at all and take them all out. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but yeah, the, the third of the Changeling Fall is two or three years behind because, like, lives just sometimes fall apart and that's what happens and it's fine like you know it's yeah. great to hit deadlines but also life happens and when life happens it does and that's fine it's you know and feeling guilty about it I don't think helps in any direction yeah well, I wish I was one of those people that you know my my sister during all of this has written way more she's become way more productive than she used to be and it's because writing is her escape. Um, mm -hmm. So she can escape into it. Me, I sit down and there are some days where I'm like, there's so much other crap going on in my head that I can't focus on the, on what's on the page. Yeah, and that's been a big problem for a lot of people right now is just having a hard time focusing because their mental energy is elsewhere, understandably. Right. Um, and we have a thing in my critique group, there are five of us and, um, the ones who are currently, like one is a mostly off Delta first officer. Um, she and another friend of mine who's a stay-at-home mom who has teenagers that she kind of has to tangentially keep an eye on. Every day at 12, they do writing sprints. And so it's basically dedicated time to do whatever they need to do, whether it's writing or editing. And that's actually helped our slow writers in the group to get more productive because it's like, okay, I have this dedicated time. I'm just going to spit out the words. Um, and luckily I'm a fast writer, so I can mostly keep to my deadlines and everything. Also, I'm independently published. So that means I pay my editor. And if I don't get my work to her on time, she doesn't get paid on time. So that kind of keeps me on track. Um, well, I did want to be sure we talk about, cause it sounds like you guys are pretty much mostly traditionally published. So, but I think it's still going to be the same for all of us and that we all still have to connect with readers whether we are independently published or going through a traditional or traditional type publisher, what is your favorite way to connect with your readers? And do you find readers uh, for different genres in different places? And then what genres have you found to have good overlap? Because I know I've definitely found that a lot of readers who read urban fantasy are also, they're also liking to read steampunk. So, and this is three questions all at once, which they tell us in psychology school not to do, but I'm doing that to you guys anyway. I will say for genres, I have a lot of good success with basically urban fantasy and horror comedy, um, mixing that. with paranormal and science fiction. <laughs> I, I actually have pulled people over to science fiction, mostly because I have a lot of mythological elements um, tied in all of them, because I found that almost every urban fantasy fan also loves Stargate. Um, it just seems to work that way. I love to connect with fans on social media. I try not to be an ogre. I found that Facebook groups are really good for engagement and building more of the super fans because the more you can get people who just genuinely like you, I find that they'll, they'll pimp your work out for you. Um, and I find that I get, it might not be the biggest reach as like paid advertising, but I tend to get more sales conversions when there's more of a personal connection. If you can become anyone's favorite writer, I mean, other than the huge ego trip, um, it's a great marketing tool. Um, and I guess the big thing I found is that um, if you want to be on social media, it helps to either be incredibly political or completely apolitical. Don't go in the middle. Um, and just always remember that everything on the internet is forever. You think it's not, but just mm -hmm. don't say anything that you wouldn't want printed on your tombstone. And in general, it tends to work. 
um, I just wish I had a bigger newsletter because I was one of the people that got paranoid because I'm an internal auditor by day and knew can pave my whole list for GDPR because I was not going to get sued by anybody. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> oh, I feel better now. That makes me feel a lot better. Yeah, I did the same thing. Um, I use Facebook groups a lot. Um, I'm the same way. I always feel like romance is kind of like participating in this gigantic Girl Scout bake sale. Like you have to, you have to make friends with everybody that you want to buy for one of your brownies. I mean, you know, and there are days when that's great. And there are days when that's like, oh my God, I really don't have time to sit here and talk in this group for like 45 years. But, you know, you do what you got to do. And, um, and in addition to making some great reader connections, you also make some great personal connections as well. So that's probably, that's probably primarily how I do it. But I mean, um, I, of course I have a newsletter that will eventually start going out again. Cause I was just, I did the same thing yeah. as, um, as Rachel, I, I gutted my group. So. <laughs> um, I'm just starting to learn how I have a new newsletter. And after this, I'm going to look into Facebook groups. <laughs> I am on Twitter. I am blessed with a name that is ridiculously easy to find. Um, I publish under Emily Leverett and Emily Lavin Leverett um, without my middle name for the romance, with my middle name for my scholarship and my um, fantasy. So if somebody wants to find me and they remember just the Leverett, they'll find me. Um, and like, like my co-author is Sarah Adams. Good luck with that. Yeah. Um, and, Short name problems. Yeah. And so I have the kind of visibility that makes I think it a little easier, but I'm still spending a lot of time learning how to get people to want to talk to me. Um, I mean, I'm a teacher. I spend most of my life understanding that people don't want to listen to me. So, <laughs> you know. I am the world's worst when it comes to marketing. I'm terrible at it. Um, I do have newsletters for both of my pen names and they are very very small because I did just dump everything and start over so they're very small they need to be bigger um, I like Emily I'm still learning how to be a person in front of other people I guess um, I don't like to talk about myself and so that's really hard so but I've been pushed into creating Facebook groups you know I'm on Twitter I'm on Facebook I'm on Instagram I will talk to anybody. I'm just not very good at starting the conversations myself. I, I am very much an introvert with serious social anxiety problems. So <laughs> it's, it's been a challenge. It really has. Okay. It's, it's getting better. Mm -hmm. I don't bite. I promise. I have been told in the past that I'm really intimidating in person, which is hilarious because I'm probably the most harmless creature on the planet. <laughs> So, um, and in my case, I have a newsletter. Um, I do curate and I just dumped about 600 people. So I've stamped about 2,400 and I've not done any builders lately. So I need to get back to doing that. Do not have a Facebook group. Um, I try to spend as little time as possible on Facebook, but I'm probably going to have to relent and do that. Um, I do a fair amount of paid advertising. I'm also on Twitter as Cecilia Dominic. Um, my Instagram is pretty much wine, food, and cat pictures. As it uh, should be. Because as, as you guys saw, I have the world's cutest cat, and I do stand <laughs> by that. So, um, yeah, that's typically where people will find me. I don't do a lot of book stuff on Instagram. So, uh, well, thank you guys. We are about out of time. Um, I know that's a psychologist thing to say. And so just wanted to say thank you guys so much for such a great discussion. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch with us, um, you can find us at our websites. We also mentioned our social media. And I know that there are things going on with the Discord. Hopefully, we'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to get in touch with us there. And like, I know we all have books for sale, ebooks, and, you know, I am definitely, and I'm sure the others are willing to uh, sell you some signed paperbacks as well. And we will not get our feelings hurt if you put it in mail quarantine for a couple of days before opening it. <laughs> so... Thank you guys so much again and have a great rest of your con and week.